Okay, hey everybody, hope you had a nice short break. Um, thanks for joining us once again. And just a quick reminder, a set of reminders is before we get started. Everyone is on mute. If you are using the event app, we please uh, encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and please be sure to complete the session survey. The session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop mobile site. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Mike Murray. Mike? Thanks, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Yeah, Mike Murray here from SecureWorks. Uh, glad to virtually see everybody. As Tracy mentioned, I'll be the moderator for this session. Um, just a couple brief items before I hand the the, the presentation over to, to Trey and Andres. Um, so please ask uh, uh, or uh, any questions you've got for the, the presenters, post them in the Q&A section there at the, the bottom of your screen. We will uh, we'll circle back to those at the end of the, the session, leave some time. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know if you run into any other snags along the way. Um, with that introduced briefly, uh, Trey Darley from CERT BE and Andres, I'm not gonna try to butcher your last name, apologies, um, who are presenting on coloring outside the lines effectively uh, breaking out a bigger box of, of crayons to expand the context around uh, threat information sharing. With that, I'll hand it over to you, gentlemen. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Uh, I am Trey Darley. Uh, joining me is Andres Iclodi. Uh, I I've known him long enough that I feel comfortable to butcher his name. So welcome everyone. Uh, the goal of today's session is to talk a little bit about information sharing in general and to highlight how threat information may come in different shapes and sizes. So that means anything from those simple indicator lists that we see all too often, more often than we wish, uh, uh, up to those well-formed contextualized graphs of information. And what we want to do is we want to basically talk about how to get from one to the other. So how to convert our indicator lists when we're producing data into that rich well-formed data set and why you should care about doing that. So we're going to look at uh, some different uh, profiles uh, of uh, user profiles that are typically consuming this, the information that we produce and highlight how that would affect them. We're also going to give you some practical pointers on how to basically, uh, uh, what sort of questions you should be asking yourself when you're creating the data in order to get to this more rich data set. So common user profiles. Um, I'm not going to read this slide at you, but I'm sure that you recognize a number of these roles. They exist within probably each and every one of your organizations, maybe not all, but at least some. And it's important to note here that when it comes to cyber threat intelligence sharing, um, these different types of folks, they're, tr they're trying to solve different problems from the same data set. So how can we make their lives simpler? So first of all, before we go into the uh, into depths of, of how to do exactly that, uh, let's talk a little bit about the two main roles that we can play in the information exchange. So one of them is us being consumers and whenever we're in that role, we basically have to consider how can we make our information, first of all, consumable by, by everyone. So that means the basics, getting formats and so on, right? But also useful to them. And this is uh, going to be the linchpin of the entire talk, basically, where we look at the different uh, aspects of how to make this information actually more useful by contextualizing it so that it makes sense to the recipients of the data. Now, most of the time when we're on the receiving end of the data, that means that, uh, uh, that we don't have all this power to basically en uh, ensure that the data is contextualized from the get-go. There are some exceptions. It might be that you have influence over whoever is producing the data for you. For example, if it's a different team within your organization, if it's a vendor that you're paying money to and so on. So in that case, by all means, use that power that we have. But on the receiving side, the situation still isn't hopeless. If the data is at least somewhat contextualized, you can use that context to better filter out the data for your different tools, for your different processes, and to extract knowledge from the data uh, itself. So let's uh, see how we can uh, uh, basically get to these points where you get this uh, knowledge out of data. 
uh, who hasn't received this type of thing? I, I first saw a list that very similar to this back in the late 90s. Um, what even is this? It might be useful. It might be not. Uh, it lacks context. So be before we go into, um, uh, into bashing that type of information sharing, there is one thing to get out of the way. There are some cases where data carries inherent context based on the source. That means that if you're extracting indicator lists that are flat, like what the one that Trey has shown without any uh, metadata around the information, it can still be useful as long as it is coming from a source where you know the intent of why that data was shared in the first place. For example, tracking certain types of threat actors, tracking certain uh, uh, evolving um, infrastructure points for the same type of attack, or if it's uh, one of those metadata fleets. For example, one of the ones that we use is also the Tor exit node list that we use to quickly identify uh, whether an IP address is actually belonging to uh, attacker infrastructure is just a Tor exit node. So whenever we're dealing with these sort of, of, uh, of uh, uh, lists, what we are about to talk about does not apply, obviously. So we're not here to talk about the exception, of course. So let's get back to on, on track with the talk. So first of all, that flat indicator list, if I had, if it just had a title, what is it? That would have helped me so much as a recipient. Um, so as a producer, consider on the receiving end that it's not just some machine, some data processing thing that's going to be eating up a list of hashes, but that there's going to be a human being involved in, at some step in the process. So at least include some kind of title on your report. Wherever possible, include some prose explanation. Uh, it, it doesn't in any way have a negative impact on the ability for uh, defensive mechanisms, you know, appliances, endpoint protection to parse that out. But if, if you think about that, that list of flat indicators, that's like uncommented code. Um, I don't just comment code because of future maintainability for other people. I comment my code because three months from now, I come back and I look at a thing and I have no idea what I was trying to do. So when you put some basic prose on your threat reports, it corresponds with the data points that you're conveying. You're not only helping a recipient externally, but you, you're you're practicing something good that's going to help you down the road as well. So apart from assigning context, one of the things to get right, and this is something that is often overlooked, is you're dealing with it very often when you're sharing information with a large constituency of different types of organizations out there. One of the things that you should also consider is that these organizations will, and, these and everyone in your community will use the data differently. You need to give them some uh, some guidelines on what they're allowed to do with the data, who they can share, pass the information on. So when it comes to deciding what uh, can be done with the data, one of the things to consider is, uh, can it be used, for example, for active measures? Are you worried about informing the attacker potentially and burning the, uh, the fact that you know this information? In those cases, there are some frameworks that help you basically to restrict uh, or at least and, uh, uh, to mark the information to not be used in, the, in, in those specific cases. So PAP is one of those exa uh, examples for those libraries, the permissible action protocol. It's very simplistic, similar to TLP, but the idea is it, uh, it tells the recipient uh, what they're allowed to do with the data. The other side is that no matter what tool you're sharing your information with, that data will end up in a PDF report. It will be shared with peers via phone calls and so on. Make sure that you tell the recipient of the data what they can uh, do with the data afterwards in terms of extracting the data from the system and passing it on to someone else. TLP, IPF are great for this. Something else that, uh, that might be uh, applicable to your community might be also national classification schemes, military classification schemes, depending on what sort of an organization you're in. So within a threat report, every data point has, uh, it's an element within an overall narrative. So put context around those data points 
to tell the story. Uh, an IP address, uh, was it a connectivity check for malware? Uh, was it a compromised host? Was it part of attacker infrastructure? Do you know what role it played as attacker infrastructure? Um, a very useful tool. Uh, if we're gonna play some kind of buzzword bingo here, MITRE ATT&CK, um, but put some attack techniques around those indicators um, and, and think carefully about what problem you're trying to solve with this. All too frequently, um, I see threat reports where people have thrown a bunch of MITRE ATT&CK tags at the top level of a report, um, I guess, because we want to be hip and keep with the times. But scoping matters. Um, does a bit of context, whether we're talking about PAP, TLP, or MITRE ATT&CK, or what have you, does it really apply at the level of the entire report? Or is it specific to a SHA hash, an IP address, a mutex? Um, consider the utility of the context that you're applying, and also think about the impact that it's going to have down the road when you try to do sort of longitudinal analysis across your entire data set. So going back to the individual data points that we've talked about until now, most of the time when we are dealing with information, uh, we are not dealing with data points in a vacuum. They all are part of a, a larger story, and we basically uh, can either omit this and share the data points as a list, or we can go the extra effort and basically also reveal this information and this knowledge that we have about how the data points belong together. Think of the, the most simple use case. Very often we're describing the same concept via different uh, means. That means if we're sharing information about the file, for example, a malicious file, we might include all sorts of data points that relate to the file. Now these things, if we don't mark them as something that belongs together and that form an, uh, that basically where we use atomic uh, uh, data points to describe something complex, this gets lost in translation. It means extra burden on whoever is using the data. On the other hand, whenever we are dealing with different concepts, when we're analyzing an incident, for example, we're, we, we know the story of what happened by analyzing our logs and so on. Now, it is really important to include this whenever we want uh, the recipients to anticipate next steps of an attack. For example, if we have a file, an email, a malware, and an attacker infrastructure in our set of, uh, of data points, we can phrase this kind of like a sentence where we can say that this file was attached to an email and when we extracted uh, data from the file, we, we saw a malware in there, which was then used to, be, to contact a C2 using this attacker infrastructure. The moment you include that, you immediately build knowledge instead of just data. So we build threat reports out of our internal data that we've gathered from within our organization, whether that's a post-mortem from an uh, incident response, telemetry from our network sensors, et cetera from external data, uh, commercial sources, trust groups, et cetera. And often our reports are a hybrid of internally collected data and externally collected data. It's vitally important that you label your source wherever possible and that you label your confidence in the source always. So sometimes you may not be able to declare, disclose the source whether that's for commercial reasons, because your national security agency passed along some super top secret information, disclose the source for the data wherever possible, disclose, like put your confidence on that data always. So ultimately, what the main reasons why we're sharing information is to basically help our peers protect themselves. And this should be the ultimate goal that we can achieve in different ways. Besides sharing the information itself, one of the things that we can also influence is how useful the data becomes to the recipient. For example, if, our, uh, if we're dealing with different organizations with different maturity levels, we might need to, to also consider doing a little bit of extra handholding that we ourselves would not anticipate with the data, for example, including information that can be used for indicator lifecycle management, uh, such as, for example, trust in source, uh, the sources trust in data, all these different data points that uh, Trey has already mentioned, along with uh, a bunch of different ways to contextualize the data, helps a lot. 
Also, we can give suggestions on how to best use the data. For example, if we see certain indicators that are best uh, uh, used by uh, analyzing our logs from our scenes uh, in, in the scenes or versus uh, uh, things that are pushed to an IDS, include that information with the data so that whoever is the recipient knows how to make best use of it. On the other hand, something else that we might want to include, and this is different uh, from what we mentioned before about uh, encapsulating the data and telling the recipient who they can share the data with, Another thing we can do is tell the recipient who they should be sharing the data with, who might be interested in it. Maybe this is data relevant for any organizations they know in the financial sector. In that case, include that information so that they know who to pass the information along to. Also, if you have supporting materials that you've produced for the data, including uh, reports that you've used in your analysis, homebrew scripts that you've built, Sigma rules, and so on that, you, that you've built yourself for your own detection, include those as well. They go a long way with helping especially lower maturity organizations make use of the data. So configurations, that means if you know that something exploits vulnerable configurations, include the information how to best protect yourself against those along with the data set. Attribution, now we touch the third rail. The purpose of attribution, for when you're dealing with cyber threat intelligence, unless you are working in law enforcement or for a national security agency, you don't really care about the geopolitics. What you really care about is understanding the modus operandi and the goals of a particular set of threat actors to help you to anticipate how they might pivot within your organization. If you're in the middle of a IR or a threat hunt uh, or for where you want to deploy uh, your preventative measures. Um, attribution, focus on intent and modus operandi. Do not get hung up on nation state geopolitics. So Using some of these concepts that we've mentioned before, we basically have here an example uh, of what data might look like in a tabular form with all these data points attached. So you can see here that, that basically we get a lot of information along with each data point. So we see those uh, individual hashes and so on there that are now part of a collective. So described in being a more complex concept such as a file, such as a domain IP object and so on, along with different uh, points of uh, contextualization such as information about uh, the malware that is being used there. So we see their MLpedia uh, description. We see MITRE attack patterns. So those are highly valuable that we'll talk about later on why they're really important to include, as well as guidance on how to use the data. So what the user is allowed to do with the data, for example, can they use it for active research? We see some of those data points, not so much. The other ones, yes. This kind of information is already included uh, in this type of report. And here we see that same data, but represented as a graph. These are the same data points that we started off with in that flat list of indicators. But by simply doing a little bit of work to show the relationships between those, now I could look at this picture, know nothing about your environment, and I could tell you the story of what's happening. So. so let, let's talk about how this would actually affect the different user groups. So we've seen the, basically the different types of questions that we should be asking ourselves when creating the data. And obviously this takes a lot of effort. So compared to just throwing out the indicator lists, this means that you have to put in some extra legwork. But let's see how this actually affects the recipients of the data. So here, let's start with the first example with an incident responder. Now, one of the trickiest things for an incident responder is the amount of pressure that you're under during incident response. That means that you're basically under time pressure, which increases your risk of misunderstanding data that you're looking at and misunderstanding concepts that you're trying to involve in your process. So one of the things that we can do basically when you're producing data to, to relieve this pressure basically is to make it clear what the intent of data points are and to basically explain why those data points are relevant in the first place. So in most of, the, of these cases, when you're dealing with instant response, you don't really care about all the different data points that someone else has seen, what you care about is the story. That means you use your individual data points that you extract during your process as pivot points to find similar uh, types of data that have been shared. And then you look at the story to anticipate what to look for next, for example. Mm -hmm. 
So for a SOC operator, different focus, detection and prevention. I have yet to hear of anyone complaining that they didn't get enough alerts. Now, the typical way of managing this is by filtering the input data set that you're putting into your alerting tools. But the better labeled your data set is, with the more contextualized it is, the easier it is for you to filter out what is and is not interesting for your organization. Uh, so this enables you to, as a SOC operator, to make better informed decisions about uh, when to search for something, uh, what time span was it valid for, where might you want to look for it in your, in your organization, um, et cetera. It, it, it dramatically reduces, uh, the, again, the cognitive energy load for a SOC operator having contextualized data. So contrary to a SOC operator, let's look at a different example, namely an ISP that is trying to protect their users. So this is one of those uh, cases where uh, the risk appetite for false positives is incredibly low. So when you're basically blocking data for a large set of users, then blocking something by accident, such as facebook.com might cause a riot or it might stop one, but that's a different story. But seeing what, what we have included knowledge about with the data, we basically included information about our trust in the data, uh, basically context on why this data was relevant and in what context it has been seen, what functional role it played in an incident. And using these different data points, an ISP would in this case be able to make decisions on what is fit for blocking and what will they use for their own internal detection and so on, but not necessarily for the block list that they're pushing to uh, users or that uh, they're blocking uh, user access to. So how would this look for a threat analyst? Well, threat analysts, um, they're more focused on the, that MITRE attack type data, the, the threat actor groups that they're tracking, their modus operandi, their goals. Um, so when we have put that context into our threat reports, our, when the producers that we're relying on have done so on our behalf, this makes the job of a threat analyst so much easier. Uh, this calls out uh, and highlights data regarding attacker infrastructure use, or reuse, um, and the evolution and uh, uncovering of, of new attack vectors, which you would then track. So, and now if we take all this data, let's look at what a risk analyst can do with it. Obviously, they will not really care about individual data points. They don't care what IP address your attacker used. What they care about is the aggregate of the information. That means that they want to see trends. What sort of trends are affecting my organization, my sector, my geographic location, and so on. And this is where, for example, attack plays an invaluable role. By including uh, the information on the actual attacker techniques, along with all the data that we share, we can basically aggregate this information and ask our, our different tools uh, uh, the type of questions such as how did the attacker patterns change uh, over the past year compared to how it affected um, uh, our sector a year ago, for example. So these sort of questions can easily be answered as long as we go through this effort uh, in the first place. Now, keep in mind, a lot of this is done by the tooling automatically nowadays. So as long as you just share what with the information that you have, which you inherently have when you're looking at the data, then you basically raise the, uh, the efficiency of what a risk analyst can do with the data. And the output of that is basically that the risk analyst can make better uh, give better advice to the decision makers of the different organizations. And so we come to our final role, the decision maker. In a decision maker better informed by their organization's risk analysts can make more evidence-based and effective uh, decisions regarding future resource allocations. Um, when it, whether I'm trying to allocate budget and headcount for next quarter or for a five-year time frame, I, I, I'm trying to anticipate the future. So that knowledge about the evolution of attackers' focus and techniques within my sector um, is, is key to making intelligence budgeting decisions. Um, 
this third point, uh, sorry, the second point here, um, when you have all the data sources labeled, all the references labeled, then you can assess which other organizations within my region or my sector have been sending us really high quality data. They seem to be at a high level of maturity or they seem to be uh, well confronting this similar type of threat actor well. So as a decision maker, I can reach out to my, uh, my peer uh, in these other organizations to enter into a dialogue. Um, this is also a type of information sharing, right? It's not in JSON or XML, but equally important. And lastly, but not least, um, a lot of budget goes into the procurement of commercial threat feeds. Knowing how a given threat feed um, has been useful or not to my organization over the in the past, how applicable the data that they've given me has been to enhancing the defensive posture of my organization. That's a key to making good budget decisions. And also if within that aggregate data set that my organization has um, taken in, I can see other data sources labeled that give me a place to go and look for possible additions to my, my basket of commercial feeds. So to sum it all up, I mean, one of the things that, that we try to show here is that well-structured context-rich data is good. Obviously, it takes a lot of extra work, uh, but hopefully we manage to encourage people to, to, see, to see the benefits of going through this effort, even if they don't directly use it. So for example, if you're an organization just doing detection, perhaps you don't care about all this additional context, but keep in mind that if you're in a community, you kind of want to make it work for the other parties as well. So in that case, you have a lot of advantages if you, if you spend the extra time. Uh, basically, we already have a lot of tools that, that allow us to produce this data, but we are not using any of those really to the full extent. And this is time constraints, uh, uh, the lack of, uh, of basically investment, uh, uh, time investment in, into these processes and so on. So I hope that we manage to at least ignite <laughs> the spark in a few people to basically go a little bit beyond uh, with what they share and what they include with their data. And if you're on the receiving end and you're paying for, uh, for feed vendors out there, don't settle for undifferentiated crap. Uh, raise hell until you basically get your data well contextualized instead of just flat indicator lists. That's basically it from us. If you Thank want you. to reach out to us, there are Thank some- Thank you so much for our, your time. Indeed. And we're not gonna read this slide at you, but we're gonna take your questions with what time remains. Mike, how are we doing? Thanks, gents, appreciate it. Um, there are three questions queued up. Uh, I think that we can you know, type answers to them, but generally I think they boil down to, to two things, those three questions. One is around um, examples. Uh, do we have any examples other than some of the screenshots and things I think in the presentation of what good reporting looks like, what a good uh, contextual description of, of indicators looks like, and then also um, what tooling exists to, to help, I think, specifically in capturing that information and then uh, translating it into information that's digestible for all of those different stakeholder groups that you described. I mean, uh... Yeah, ju just to briefly go through some of them. I mean, in terms of tooling, I mean, the good thing is that all the tools that we use nowadays are improving in that direction. So be it from sandboxes, all sorts of collection tools, uh, all, all the additional lookup tools that, that we've also seen here during the conference uh, already allow us to, to basically extract this information in an automated fashion. And then it's up to the analyst to do some cleanup afterwards. As for examples of good reports, that's a good point. Um, and <laughs> I think what we can do is, uh, at least as a fun example, is the thing that we used here, we can just tweet it out later on uh, with, where, so that you can look at this very simple example of where we went through for this talk from the before to the after. I, I hope that helps. <laughs> there, there were uh, taxonomies and tagging structures that Andras and I uncovered in crafting the sample that we used for our screenshots. Um, even though we use these tools every day and we can blame Andrush 
in large part for making them, <laughs> some of them, which shall remain unnamed. Um, it would be great to have some exemplary re threat reports available. That was something that we struggled with. Um, and maybe that is a work item that we could take up within the context of the CTI SIG uh, to, to have a repository, an open repository of TLP white threat reports and that you could point to and say, hey, here, this is what you should aim for. Yeah, definitely think that's a good plug for the SIG. Thanks, Trey. With that, we're out of time. Thanks again, Trey and Andres, for the, the presentation. Virtual round of applause from everybody here, I'm sure. It's great to see everybody and uh, appreciate the, the insight that you shared here. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Reach out if you have questions. <laughs>